I'll get to your, your re-rating in just a bit, but I want to get your initial take on the PMI numbers that we got over the weekend. Seasonality aside, how bad were these numbers? Well, I have to say that the numbers are probably, uh, uh, you know, not as strong as meet the eye. Uh, if you look at the headline, yes, it is still above 50. So it, uh, it came in at 50.1. But the problem, Yvonne, is that if you look at the details, I'm afraid that, for example, the sub-indices on production as well as on new orders are both edging down. And on top of that, employment is supposed to be, uh, um, you know, looking uh, looking okay, uh, according to the, the, the National Bureau of Statistics number, Released for December, but now the numbers from uh, from January on this uh, on this particular uh, PMI is suggesting that it also got softer. And, and Helen, you have been probably one of the most bearish in the street right now uh, when it comes to b the growth forecast for 2022. You were kind of the solid bottom among the consensus, uh, and now you're saying it's time <laughs> for a bit of an upward <laughs> revision. Walk us through that, because it went from 4 percent, we're talking to now nearly 5 percent growth for this year. What's driving that? Yes, we have uh, upgraded our GDP growth forecast for 2022 from 4.0 to 4.8 percent. So the biggest drive, however, uh, it's not extremely exciting. It's mainly because of marking to market what has been released from the uh, fourth quarter 2021 numbers. Uh, there was also a revision of the passive trajectory for 2020 to 2021. So it was mainly this, um, you know, kind of looking at the past and adjusting what has been released in the base that has pushed up for the uh, push up the entire numbers. We are still concerned about growth. This is not saying that we're super bullish and growth is going to be a lot higher. Just that by the fact that if you look at the uh, uh, the ultimate uh, forecast, still below five percent, at a time when the government almost is surely is going to deliver an official forecast at five percent or above, and uh, that probably suggests that you know we we think that there is a high probability we are we're not going to see this number uh, you know very safely unless we see more uh, policy easings coming out. Well, well, we have seen them, th th this policy turn. I guess uh, the question there would be then when does the economy start to feel and, and start to reflect that policy turn that we have seen in recent weeks? And, you know, at, at about 5%, then would you say there's upward risk, upside risk to, to that growth forecast then? That is a great question, David. Um, I'm afraid that at the moment we see balanced risk to either side of the our forecast. And the main reason is that yes, uh, they have shifted the, uh, mm. the the policy stance towards uh, easing very notably during the Central Economic Working Conference, and after that they have reiterated, you know, repeatedly. But the problem that we see uh, there are three of them that still have, um, you know, basically held our concerns about the uh, the overall growth momentum, uh, you know, very much uh, uh, very much unchanged. Not Number one is that we are concerned about the deleveraging that is very severe from last year. The PBOC's data suggests a 7.5 percentage point of a reduction in overall leverage rate in the year of 2021. Uh, and we think that it will take a while for any uh, easing to kick in, especially now with the credit demand being extremely weak. The second reason is that we are still seeing a general lack of coordination among the different ministries. Yes, the PBOC is okay. doing a lot of things, saying a lot of things, but uh, and, and unfortunately others are not. And the last thing is basically that we think uh, the, the, uh, there is less room for policy easing than we originally expected. Uh, does that also apply to fiscal policy? Because arguably that tends to have a quicker effect on the economy. And how are they going to pay for it? Where's the budget going to come from? Well, we hope that the the, uh, the government, uh, um, you know, easing is going to kick in sooner rather than later. But uh, when it comes down to fiscal, I'm afraid of it that you will see that the uh, the challenges are that they won't be able to lift the uh, headline uh, budget deficit number by quite a lot. Most likely, it's still uh, around the three percent. 
And on top of that, for local government special purpose bond issuance, uh, which we think that they can at least lift it uh, above last year's uh, quota number, which is $3.65 trillion. Uh, but according to Bloomberg article, this number probably would be kept a flat, uh, flat. We were thinking that they can actually raise it a little bit further towards $4 trillion, but that seems to be a, a bit challenging at the moment. So if that is the case, then, you know, ultimately, what do we depend upon, uh, you know, on the uh, on the fiscal policy easing, um, you know, becoming more intensified? The only possibility that comes is actually for credit easing, which is allow the banks to give more credit to uh, local governments or local government financing vehicles. But right now, this particular constraint is still very much in place. Um, and we are afraid that uh, unless we see significant relaxation of the credit controls on local government and LGRVs, we won't necessarily see a very powerful fiscal impulse because it has always have to be married with a, a mm. credit expansion. And they're, and they're not exactly getting that sort of income from property sales, uh, so to speak, too, Helen. And, and we had a story last week just talking about how mm. a lot of these LGFVs, these local government financing vehicles, are now the biggest buyers of land sales right now, replacing these of developers. Land. How big of a risk is that, that these cities themselves are, are essentially buying their own land? <laughs> yes, that's indeed concerning because uh, if developers are no longer the big buyers for land, who is going to step in? Well, at the moment, it is LGRVs. But ultimately, if their credit is not being substanti substantially supported by the banking system, then they have very limited capacity to keep supporting the land, mar land auctions. And uh, therefore, for fis local government's fiscal revenue, there is additional risk there. So we have written about such risks back in uh, uh, back in December, and we have argued that uh, this uh, um, could be currently cushioned by the fiscal revenue uh, increase, um, you know, that was above budget back in 2021. But coming to 2022, if we see continued, um, you know, uh, sluggish uh, property sales and combined with uh, land sales, this is probably going to hurt local government fiscal revenue quite uh, quite significantly. And if that is the case for certain provinces with high leverage, this could be a problem.